And uh, yeah, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm happy to present to you some work uh, in our lab on computational modeling of protein RNA interaction. So RNA binding proteins are involved in pretty much every aspect of cross-transcription regulation. So this starts at transcription already over to splicing, export of RNAs to the cytoplasm, localization of RNAs, of course, translation and also degradation of RNAs. So in this talk, I will mention a lot proteins binding to RNAs, proteins binding transcripts, proteins binding to specific sites. But of course, the vice versa is also true. So one can equally argue that RNAs are also acting on IBPs in order to recruit them, to, for example, as stabilizing, uh, as stabilizing factors. But for this talk, I will take the view of RBPs binding or acting on RNA molecules. So there are a lot of methods that one can use to profile um, binding of uh, proteins to RNA in vivo. And um, one that's, um, well, in recent years, very popular because it um, has high spatial resolution of the binding sites uh, is ClipSec or derivatives like enhanced ClipSec, which offer single nucleotide resolution. And I will briefly give an overview of this protocol because this is the main data I'm using in, in this work. So here one starts with radiating cells with UV light, and this forms covalent crosslinks between proteins and the bound RNAs. Subsequently, you can uh, use a protein-specific antigene or antibody, I mean, um, to pull down the protein of interest. Then the protein uh, RNA uh, complex gets purified and uh, the protein gets partially digested. And this is for, uh, followed by reverse transcription, which often leads um, to premature truncation at the site of the protein RNA uh, cross-linking because there's a small peptide uh, remaining at this site, which acts as a physical barrier. And when one then later um, performs high, through the sequ high throughput sequences on these uh, cDNAs um, and maps the reads to the reference genome, one can observe these very characteristic pileups of read starts, which then serves as an experimental signal to perform some downstream analysis, most commonly peak calling, which involves basically identifying sites where those um, cross-link events are enriched, which then uh, are usually labeled as binding sites of this protein. And of course, these proteins don't just bind randomly across the transcriptome. They usually have specificity uh, to specific um, sequence or um, higher order structural motifs. Um, and one of the main tasks uh, in researching protein RNA interaction is to uncover which proteins have which binding preferences. So lots of the questions um, that we might have can be answered with this data directly. So I think a natural question to ask is why do we even need a model? Why can we not just interpret this data directly using model-free approaches? And I think there are two main advantages of having a model. The first one, and I think the most obvious one is that it allows us to impute missing information. For example, we can impute binding information on transcripts that has not been expressed in the experimental cell type, but it also allows us to impute signal on foreign RNAs like uh, virus derived RNAs. The second advantage is that um, we can probe a model quite easily and quite inexpensively in silico. Uh, to gain a better mechanistic understanding of the protein RNA interaction. And for example, we can use in situ mutagenesis to score the impact of variants on binding. So I'm going to present two studies uh, from our lab. And actually, I do it in the reverse order that um, Julian, Julian was uh, presenting. Um, I just decided it quite spontaneously because I think the first one gives a good introduction of why we perhaps need better models. Um, so the first work is concerned with using um, a model for imputation, specifically using models trained on human eclip data to predict binding sites of human RBPs to the SARS-CoV-2 RNA. 
And the second one is concerned with um, kind of a novel approach um, where we kind of move away from modeling um, these binary labels, the binding and non-binding, towards an approach that uh, models the underlying raw signal of the experiment directly. So in order for a cell to, uh, in order for a virus to successfully enter and replicate um, in a cell, two things, uh, two properties, um, well, the cell needs to fulfill two properties. One is that it has to be susceptible to the virus, meaning that it can enter the viral uh, uh, at the cell. For example, in countries of SARS-CoV-2, that would be the ACE2 receptor. And it has to be permissive. So the host environment um, has to be such that the virus can successfully replicate. Um, in general, in context of viruses, but uh, also SARS-CoV-2, RBPs are known to be important host factors in uh, infection. And um, well, naturally you want to know more about them and how, uh, where specifically they bind in their SARS-CoV-2 uh, RNA, but this can be quite costly. So there are hundreds of uh, RBPs and um, theoretically we have to perform a dedicated CLIPSEC experiment for each single one. So it can quickly accumulate to, um, yeah, a non-feasible amount that has to be spent. So an obvious approach is why we, uh, to use existing human um, eclip data, so the data generated in human cell lines, to then um, build models and predict where binding may occur uh, in the SARS-CoV-2 RNA. <clears throat> and in this project, that's pretty much exactly what we did. So here we um, gathered hundreds of eclip experiments from the ENCODE project. And for each experiment, we selected called peaks as our positive samples, and then regions without observed peaks as our negatives. And we used the PISTA framework, which is a convolutional neural network working on RNA and DNA sequences, to train a binary classifier to classify an input RNA sequence as being bound by a protein of interest or not bound. And since we're interested in profiling binding across the entire SARS-CoV-2 RNA, we used a one-step sliding window approach to scan the RNA sequence, where in each window, we are assigning the predicted binding score to the center base. And this way, we get a sort of pseudo nuclear resolution signal across the RNA. And subsequently, we apply thresholding and define stretches of high scoring uh, sites as binding, predicted binding sites um, on the RNA sequence of the virus. So since we evaluated hundreds of models and some of them were quite uh, low quality, um, we applied very stringent cutoffs to only select those models where we believe that they are actually providing genuine binding information from sequence. So we applied two metrics here. One is I think the well-known area under precision recall metric. And this we applied directly on the positive and negative uh, held out uh, samples that we gathered in the previous step. But then we also um, applied a second metric, which maybe measures more, it's more close to the application um, that we tend uh, plan to use these models. And that uh, we term performance in practice. And here we, um, sampled randomly 10, 100 transcripts with at least one um, experimentally validated binding site. And then we um, computed a binding profile um, with the sliding window approach across the entire transcript, and then computed the correlation of these scores with peaks, so experimentally validated peaks. Um, and afterwards, we basically um, have two performance metrics, and we applied the cutoff both in the area and precision recall, as well as the median correlation across these held out transcripts to select high confidence models. <clears throat> so unfortunately, we didn't have much experimental data to validate this method, but um, there were um, some data from uh, Schmidt et al. Um, where they performed ECLIP in, in SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, context. And this is visualized here. 
So on top, you see the eclip um, signal as the full change of the signal over the control. In the middle, the called narrow peaks, and at the bottom, the um, prediction scores of the CMBP Pystrom model. And as you can see, the predictions recapitulate the signal quite well and coincide also well with the called peaks. And when we look on the right hand side, we see that prediction scores are on average much higher within peaks than outside peaks. <clears throat> so using all high confidence models, we then scanned the entire SARS-CoV-2 sequence and created an silico binding map of uh, human RBPs binding to the SARS-CoV-2 uh, RNA. We also performed some hypothesis testing by shuffling the entire viral sequence and therefore uh, identified proteins that um, have significantly enriched number of binding sites on the observed sequence versus the background. And um, we also clustered RBPs based on their binding profiles in the virus. And one such cluster here, cluster four, we identified as being mostly associated um, with functions such as stability, translation and localization. And uh, that's quite interesting because of course, it's in the interest of the virus to um, stabilize its RNA to um, yeah, um, replicate efficiently in the virus, uh, in, in the host cell. So this concludes the first part. There were quite a few people involved. So most of the lab actually uh, was involved in this project. Um, and here I want to mostly thank uh, Lambert, um, Nalisa, Svetlana, and uh, Amy. And we also had collaborators, uh, namely from the Ola lab and from Knowing AO, uh, for example, Nicola, who was a former PI at the Health Center. <clears throat> okay. So the model we used in the previous study it's a classification-based uh, model, meaning that given a sequence, we are the, the model is tasked to classify whether the protein is bound somewhere in this sequence or not bound. In this project, we tried to move towards an approach where we model the raw data of the experiment directly. And the motivation behind this is that if you look at this these two examples of signal footprints um, from an ECLIP experiment. On the left side, you see a footprint where there were two binding sites called. And on the right hand side, you see uh, one where there are no binding sites called. And this might be correct, but um, I think it's um, pretty clear that when we compress both of these footprints to just a single bit, meaning binding or non-binding, we are guaranteed to lose information. And um, of course, the uh, issue here is that we might lose information that's uh, helping us to understand the biology better. So besides loss of information through binary labeling, these uh, classification-based methods have other downsides. One is that it's, uh, they heavily rely on post-processing for labeling. So as I mentioned earlier, we need a p-caller to actually define what is a binding site and not a binding site. And there's quite a variety of those. And each of those peak callers usually has <clears throat> quite a few hyperparameters that one can tune. And each of these steps or choices heavily affect what we actually consider positive samples. In addition, we need to generate negatives because by definition, CLIPS only provides us with information where there's binding happening or where there's cross-linking happening. But um, negatives are not observed explicitly. So we can define them by implicitly or by assuming wherever we don't see signal, this is a negative. But um, in general, sampling of negatives have to be done quite carefully because um, if we're not careful, we might introduce bias into the model or into the training set, which is then picked up by the model. And last but not least, and I think that's 
most relevant for applications like the one I um, showed you previously, where we're actually interested in scanning long sequences of RNA, is that classification-based methods usually have low resolution because we input the RNA sequence of perhaps a couple of hundred of nucleotides in length. And the prediction, the scalar prediction provided by the model is assigned to the entire window. So quite low spatial resolution. So there's lots of research, of course, on computation modeling of protein interaction, and there's been many successes. Um, but most of those studies focus rather on the left-hand side of, of the modeling, uh, meaning here the inputs. So there are many studies that incorporated secondary or even high order RNA structure in the model to improve performance. There are studies that incorporated genomic location, like um, untreated regions or introns or exons, et cetera, into the model to improve prediction. And people have also experimented with different encoding schemes. So instead of just inputting the one hot encoded sequence, uh, people tried to embed KMERS into some higher space and then use that as an input for the model. While on the right hand side, meaning the response, people mostly stuck with um, binary labels. And this is the part that we uh, yeah, aim to improve on. So in the domain of genomics, um, there's been actually quite a, a few quantitative approaches recently published. Um, I think some of you might have heard of uh, BPNet or the Informer from the lab from uh, David R. Kelly, um, led by uh, Siga Afsek. And um, these models um, go exactly in that direction in, in the context of functional genomics, where the goal is rather than predicting some binary response, they want to predict the experimental signal directly, right? So like, for example, read coverage, et cetera. And inspired from this, we tried to develop our own method in the domain of RNA and protein RNA interaction to um, also model the uh, experimental signal of clip directly rather than some binarized version of the signal. So before I go ahead, I really want to talk about experimental biases in ClipSec because this is um, super important. Um, what this is something we have to consider when modeling. So Clip has multiple sources of technical bias. Um, some of these are enhanced for the reactivity of some nucleotides. For example, uridines are more photoreactive, so the cross-linking probability is a little bit higher there. Um, one well, another soft bias could be co-purification with um, RBPs that are very abundant. And then later, if we are performing um, sequencing, we might um, rather identify cross-links of those RBPs uh, than our target RBP. Se uh, restriction enzymes um, have their own sequencing bias, uh, sequence biases uh, during library preparation, and there are uh, probably many more. So um, what's currently done um, in eclip is that the experiment is paired with a control which is termed size matched input where basically one just omits the uh, immune precipitation step so instead of pulling down the uh, protein of interest um, the experiment is performed on the entire mix of prote of proteins cross-linked uh, to rnas and this then yields a background signal um, which we then can use to identify uh, sites where um, the signal is significantly enriched over this background and which hopefully helps us to identify genuine binding sites of a protein on the transcripts. So just to quickly recall, um, these nucleate resolution clips experiments like uh, iClip and eClip generate a count signal that corresponds, where each count corresponds to protein RNA cross-linking events. And the task is now to model the distribution of counts along the input RNA sequence of the model. And I say distribution of counts because, well, one could of course also model absolute counts, but um, that's rather difficult because um, the absolute number of counts at a specific site is very much dependent on the transcript abundance in the cell type. 
that your uh, experiment was done. So that's a pretty, well, I'm not going to say impossible, but pretty difficult task. And um, it's maybe more informative to model the distribution of counts because this is going to show us where there's enrichment and where there's enrichment, there might be um, binding. So say we have um, some observed count C at um, position I. And we have that for all positions uh, along the sequence of length L. Then the task of the model is now to predict for each position the fraction among total counts that this position is receiving. <clears throat> and if we're assuming that um, these counts are multinomially distributed across the sequence, right? So where each position is basically one bucket. Then this is equivalent to predicting the parameters of a multinomial distribution. So given the sequence, the model predicts the distribution, so the vector of fractions um, of counts across this sequence. And for a specific probability vector that the model predicted, we can compute the likelihood that a multinomial distribution with that parameters explains um, ge generated these observed uh, counts. So um, we can obtain a loss by taking the negative log of this likelihood. So how do we account for experimental bias in this framework? Um, we have two observed signals. One is the eclipse signal, which I from here on term the total signal because this contains both the protein specific cross-linking signal or count signal as well as bias and we have um, the control signal which well by definition mostly contains a um, signal that comes from experimental biases so we can reformulate um, this task but, um, by um, modeling the total count distribution as an additive mixture of some unobserved component, which I term the target distribution. This represents the true and in a perfect world bias-free uh, signal and a component that represents the um, distribution of the bias signal. And both of these are weighted with mixing coefficient by pi, which gives us the relative intensity of the true signal over the control signal. And the crucial thing here is that we're modeling this as an additive mixture rather than a multinomial, uh, rather than a multiplicative, sorry. Um, because this allows us to after, uh, later disentangle the, um, the target signal from the total signal. So putting this all together, we um, basically arrive at the following architecture. We have an input, which is the one hot encoded RNA sequence, and this is fed into several residual blocks, um, where at the end we have an output feature map of this um, input sequence. And then this is fed into a model head, where we predict the uh, control probability vector, the unobserved target probability vector, and this then gets mixed into the probability vector of the total, um, which in this case is the EQB experiment. And importantly, the model is tasked to optimize joint loss on both the EQB and the control signal, because this ensures that the uh, control um, head learns a proper mapping of the RNA sequence to the control signal, right? Because otherwise, um, if we would only compute loss with respect to the E clip or in this, in this uh, figure clip, um, the model would be terribly overparametrized. And um, you can imagine the model could just um, set the uh, control to basically zero by, for example, setting the mixing coefficient to one. Um, and then we would have um, basically target equals control. So to reiterate, 
uh, in this case, then the target, the predicted target distribution explains the difference between the total and the control distribution, which in a perfect world is the true protein specific signal. So the last piece in the mix that we need is how do we um, generate or construct our train data set. And we opted here for a version that's, um, well, not unsupervised, but very close, I would say, it's because we are only, um, we basically selecting 300 nucleotide windows across the entire transcriptome using very lenient, I mean, very lenient um, cutoffs where we use, we select all windows that have um, more than eight um, observed counts. And this leads to up to a million samples for specific pro uh, for some uh, proteins um, and span the vast majority of uh, signal generated by the experiment. And this is very different, or this is in very high contrast to um, classification-based methods, which sometimes only have a couple of thousand sequences as their positives. Nice effect, since we're now using uh, likelihood-based modeling, is that um, in cases where we have um, high signal samples, so samples with very high counts, um, and the model is wrong, we very quickly get very small likelihoods. Um, so we implicitly weighting samples um, based on how much evidence there is for the specific sample. So here's one example prediction using the model trained on uh, EQ data for the QPI protein. And at the very top, so these bars, you can see the true signal. And then below in blue, red, and green, the predicted distributions of the total control and target tracks. And in the middle, we can very nicely see that the mode of the uh, total or target distribution um, corresponds to also the highest observed signal in the um, eclipse experiment. And this coincides with an ACUAA motive, which from literature is known to be a binding motive of QKI. While on the right-hand side, we see um, high elevated or high mass in the control track, but this is um, associated with a U-rich motive. And this is most likely biased um, perhaps by contamination with the U-binding RBP. So what this is supposed to show is that for this specific example, at least, um, the model nicely disentangles the true um, positive signal from the bias signal. So a nice side effect um, of having a purely convolutional architecture to model this is that we are not restricted to a specific input sequence length, at least at inference time. Um, so we train on fixed length sequences of three nuclear types. But um, when we're predicting, we can basically input arbitrary length long sequences into the model. Um, of course, we cannot capture interactions or something below uh, um, beyond these three nucleotides, but um, what this offers is that we can basically, in one forward pass, compute the predict uh, the predicted distribu uh, predict distribution of an entire transcript. So the softmax is taken over the entire transcript, so that um, yeah, all positions basically sum up to one across this transcript. And this can be several hundred thousands of positions in length. So this is an example for a model trained on human uh, nuclear protein complex um, eclipse data. And you can see in blue uh, the um, true signal, so the observed eclipse counts, and below the um, target track um, predictions of RBPNet. And on top, um, in red, you can see the well, single, single nucleotide peaks called by a peak uh, caller um, named pure clip. And um, since we now have single nucleotide position peaks, we can use these positions and view them as positives and then use all other positions as negatives and use our predictions on this transcript to compute um, 
well-known uh, performance metrics like uh, area under the rock curve or area under position v core curve. And this is actually what we did. So we took hold out transcripts for two chromosomes, two and three. Um, and we represent the performance as the mean area on the rock and area uh, an average precision um, across these whole out transcripts for each um, RBP. So on the left hand side, you can see the area on the rock performance, and we compare our predictions to a classification based method. Um, well, we had to kind of because there was not really anything we can get directly compared to because. Um, to my knowledge, most uh, basically all methods um, for protein RNA and protein RNA interpolation are classification based. So again, uh, to obtain pseudonucleotide resolution scores, we here use the sliding window approach. But one can see that on the task of single nucleotide um, p calling, um, RBPNet significantly outperforms these uh, state of the art model uh, DBRAP. And on the right hand side, you see the same, uh, the performance for the same proteins and same models, um, but um, computed as average precision. And um, these are quite low, which is due to the fact that we're dealing with extremely imbalanced data. So some transcripts are hundreds of thousands of uh, nucleotides in length and might only have a handful of um, sites that are actually called as peaks. So prediction performance is quite easy to evaluate when we have observed um, data. What's more difficult is to assess whether modeling um, the signal in a way that we disentangle uh, or that we formulate the total signal as a mixture of control and target, whether this adds something, it's a bit more challenging. So we turned to a model interpretation to see if this has any value. Um, and here you can see integrated gradients feature important scores um, for some example um, sequences of QKI. So shown are both uh, the important scores um, with respect to the target track and the control track. And again, in the top, green um, target track, you can see that the important scores are um, heavily enriched uh, at locations where there is a QKI binding motive, while the control is rather enriched in characteristic U-rich motives that uh, correspond to bias. So we performed this for a couple of thousand sites, and we gathered um, for each site the camera that is enriched, uh, well, that has the highest sum of attribution within that side. And um, then we um, summed the integrated gradient scores up across five mers and ranked them decreasingly um, based on their enrichment. And then we use um, in vitro data from RNA, so in this case, RNA compete and RNA bind and sec and also gathered the um, top enriched five mers from this in vitro data. And then we computed uh, basically the recall of our method and other methods as the fraction of the top uh, 20 integrated gradients, five mers, among the top 20 in vitro five mers. And um, on the right-hand side, as you can see very nicely, um, the control track as expected performs the worst because it's mostly enriched with bias. Um, which is followed by a classification-based method, and then the total track and the target track, which is supposed to be enriched in protein-specific signal, performs more or less on par with PICA, which is a state-of-the-art motor finder. And this was super encouraging to see because we did not optimize for this task, and uh, we still observe uh, quite comparable performance to dedicated motor finders. So additionally, we investigated um, how we can use this model to perform variant impact scoring. 
And traditionally in classification-based methods, um, it's quite straightforward. So you have your perturbed sequence, you have your reference sequence, you compute the score, and then you simply to subtract this, these scalar scores from each other, and the delta between them represents your impact score. Here, we don't have a single score. We have a um, distribution across uh, the sequence. So how do we compare those? Um, in blue, you have the distribution um, on the reference sequence. And in red, you have the distribution by introducing um, a C2A mutation. Um, and here we take uh, what defined as the impact score, the, K, the KL, sorry, the KL divergence between um, the reference sequence and the alternative sequence. So one uh, case study that we used this for um, was scoring the impact of splice variants. Um, and for this, we scattered uh, roughly 230 splicing associated mutations from with splice DB. Um, and filtered them such that we only retain mutations that uh, are a distance of less than 10 nucleotides to splice junctions. And additionally, we gather around 6,000 control mutations from Chromomat, where we use a filter of less than 100 nucleotides um, from splice junctions. And so here um, I show you one example on the left hand side for pre, -m pre mRNA splice uh, mRNA processing factor eight. And one can really nicely see that uh, in red, so the splice associated mutations have much higher impact scores on average compared to the background um, or control mutations. <clears throat> and on the right hand side, you can see a comparison um, of RBPNet and DBRIBE. Again, that's the classification based method um, on how well they're performing in separating splicing associated mutations from, from, from control mutations for a couple of different splicing associated RBPs. And here one can see that on average, um, RBPNet outperforms deep ripe on this task. Okay, so this concludes the second part. Um, again, many people involved uh, in this. Um, so on, for, from our lab was, um, mostly Dan Bear, Annalisa, and then my Hedi uh, Nicolas. Also, Gagner Lab um, contributed a lot um, here um, by Niels Wagner. Um, we also collaborated with uh, Ula Lab. So here, Clara performed the comparison with the in vitro data. And this process, uh, this project was um, partially done uh, during my guest stay at the University of Copenhagen in uh, the Winter Lab. Here are the references for the figures, et cetera. And I'm done, I think.